As it stands, the Fire Emblem series is one of the most lavish franchises in the video game industry, often being praised for the magnificent music, simple yet strategic gameplay, beautiful visuals, and above all else, the deeply engaging and intricately written stories. Well, sometimes. Yes, as great as Fire Emblem may be, and as much as I love the games, it's no stranger to having a few off days. Take for example, Path of Radiance's basic battle animations, Shadow Dragon's Snorfest soundtrack, Echo's map design, and the multitude of poor souls that dare to call themselves characters, whether they be annoying, bland, pointless, underwhelming, or a cancerous plague that infects all. Now to be fair, a bad character every now and then isn't cause for alarm, however I find that being a bad character doesn't automatically mean there isn't merit to them. Fire Emblem has a tendency to put a lot of effort into their army members, and I observe that even some of the worst warriors can have one or two moments throughout the game that showcase them in a far more favourable light. In fact, there were certain individuals that embody a multitude of traits that I greatly admire, to the point where I feel these 10 combatants are in dire need of a soft reset. So join me everyone, as these misguided misfits prepare themselves for an even greater battle, as I count down the top 10 Fire Emblem units that I feel deserve a second chance. Due to the idea of a bad character being ultimately subjective, this list is comprised of the same principle. And I'd like to stress that for the most part, I don't think all the characters on this list are bad, just that there's a lot of potential to improve upon their strengths and work around their weaknesses and ultimately make something significantly stronger. But if you feel these characters don't need improving or are too far gone that they can't be helped anyway, that's perfectly fine, you have every right to feel whichever way. Now when it comes to each entry, I will primarily be focused on adjusting the characterization, but in particular circumstances, unit performance will be factored in when I feel it's necessary, so there won't be any NPCs on this list. I'm also not including Corin or Roy, as I've covered improvements regarding Corin's characterization in my first How to Improve video, and our boy Roy I will address in a future How to Improve video. Also, this video is not about characters I feel don't get enough attention, as the likes of Sonya and Kigero are ladies that I feel get shafted far too often. However, I find them to be delightfully well-written women that don't require any refinements, especially in regards to their physique. <laughs> and with all that cleared up, I think it's time to see what happens when these Fire Emblem inequities put their best foot forward, as like Crom said, anything can change. And now the dude is playable in Smash. Cecilia. This is a rather unorthodox way to begin a list about second chances, considering Cecilia is one of the most important characters in Binding Blade and the Mage General of Euthoria. Yeah, well, Garen is the main villain of the Fates in the King of Nor, and you don't see him winning any awards aside from worse Fire Emblem villain. <sighs> My point being that just because Cecilia plays a big part in Binding Blade does not excuse the fact that she otherwise goes silent after the first half and turned out to be a disappointing unit to say the least. Which is a shame, as I feel the events of Chapter 13 could have acted as a massive turning point for our character. Not to mention living up to her title as a Mage General and being a far more worthwhile unit. And I guess getting your ass handed to you by Sophia takes its toll on you. Cecilia's initial reputation begins on a high note, being both Roy and Alina's teacher, as well as saving them from Narcian and coming off as a very noble, yet kind leader. Things take an unfortunate turn for the worst during Chapter 13, as despite her best efforts to guard the castle, Zaville shows up and whoops her ass something fierce. After surviving the ordeal, somehow, she introduces Roy to Sophia, who informs him about Arcadia, and then proceeds to do... absolutely nothing. Yeah, for some strange reason, Celia, for lack of a better term, disappears throughout the rest of the game, which I thought was largely out of place, and a huge missed opportunity for a great character arc that involves seeing her at her very lowest. Really think about it, your allies have turned traitor against you, the enemy leader has brushed you aside as if you were nothing, and as a result, the king's life is in danger. In a situation like this, I would find it very understandable for Cecilia to feel gut wrecked since her supports with Douglas shed light on the extreme prejudice she endured when applying for the role of Mage General, thus causing her to now contemplate whether or not she's worthy to be in the position she's in. This is where I feel Percival and Douglas should step in, as they would be able to reassure Cecilia that she's braver than both of them for taking on to feel, and that there isn't a finer person worthy of being Mage General. Not to mention, this could allow Roy to express how if it wasn't for her training and guidance, he wouldn't be here in the first place, thus rekindling Cecilia's spirit and giving her new resolve to once again be Roy's advisor and one of the main instigators of the Lycian army. That's all well and good, but I don't think it will mean much as Cecilia can't pull her own weight. As upon being deployed in Chapter 14, <sighs> sorry I still have PTSD, her bases are kinda low for her class, and due to the terrain, she really can't do much in most of that chapter. Now to be fair, she is still a mounted magical fighter with the ability to use staffs which gives her high utility, not to mention having high weapon ranks in both tomes and staffs, so for what it's worth, she's by no means a bad unit, I just find her to be relatively insepid. To remedy this, I believe the first step would be to push back her join time till chapter 15, as she's rather pointless in Arcadia. 
but to compensate when she becomes available, her base stats and growth rate should be increased to as follows, enabling her to deal more damage straight out of the gate and have the potential to last till endgame. All in all, a lot of the issues I have with Cecilia are far more personal as she's admittedly one of the better units and characters in Binding Blade but I feel that boosting her bulk and showing her at her weakest would help to demonstrate just how human she is while still being worthy to maintain her title as Mace Gerald of Euthoria. No one likes being out of a job after all. Aaron. I'm sure those of you who experienced Radiant Dawn will agree that the Dawn Brigade needed fathoms more screen time considering how many members lack development and the speed in which they often get shafted by the mountains of other units. In fact, the search could have exclusively been about them. Aaron and Myers was treated worse than most, and I noticed there to be sparks of intrigue regarding explicit interactions he undertook, in conjunction with the potential for one of the more useful Dawn Brigade members. God knows the needle help they can get. Not much is known about Aaron, barring the fact that he's a childhood friend of Laura, was born in Dane and later adopted into Benion, and then joined the army until defecting to the Dawn Brigade. Now to be honest, that's not much to go off, but I'd argue there's enough here to make a relatively decent character, most notably exploring his relationship with Laura. Learning about their backstories, what life was like for both of them when they parted and how grateful they are to be together again, establishing a rather sweet romance between the two and making the journey feel like it's come full circle. Due to Aaron spending a long time in Benyon, this would be a great opportunity for the player to get a better understanding of what goes on in the Benyon army and showcase both the good and bad of what came from it. Ideally, I think the likes of Fiona would be perfectly suited to support with Aaron, as she too held some day and enforced alongside Benyon, albeit for a short time, giving them common ground to build their relationship and discuss how they feel about fighting against their former allies, not to mention the prospect of Aaron engaging in many boss conversations throughout the game, adding a sense of drama to a situation and all the more reason to find solace in Laura. You know, before she gets bent because of Makai's promotion. I'm sorry, instant C rank and stars and much higher magic stat? Fuck yeah! Speaking of getting benched, it's not surprising for Aaron to end up the same way, due to his objectively poor standing as a result of low bases and an unfavourable class for the game. Granted, his growth rates give him relatively high potential, but I feel vanilla Aaron has just got too much going against him. The changes I have in mind I can't guarantee will transform him into a great unit, but at the very least they should serve to make him a worthy investment, starting off by increasing his starting level to 10 and bumping up his base stats too, with a focus on well-rounded performance along with a C rank in Lancer so we can at least make the use out of steel weapons. Now I personally feel that Aaron's growths don't need adjusting, as they emphasise a unit with high strengths and crippling weaknesses, which to be honest I think works fine for Aaron, as with this new build he would initially be a capable fighter, if a little bit behind the likes of Nolan, but with proper investment he could consistently hold his position as one of the sturdiest and hardest hitting Dawn Brigade units, plus thanks to his new bases there's a strong chance he'll cap his best stats early and thus be an excellent choice for bonus EXP to round out his weaknesses. In spite of my best efforts, I don't feel the material I've got to work with is enough to renovate Alan into an exceptional entity in Radiant Dawn. But considering how much of a clusterfuck this game can be, someone worth using in the long term and as some form of depth is a blessing in of itself. Jack. You'd think with such a large scope and extensive amount of time dedicated to its narrative, Fire Emblem 4 would have no trouble fleshing out its cuts and making them equally interesting and well developed. Regrettably, I didn't feel that was the case, and thus a lot of Sigurd's soldiers ended up being one and done chess pieces, half of which didn't even get to fire on the front lines. Look, I'm all for extensive maps in Fire Emblem, but this is taking the piss. I will give the game credit, the cast had very bold personalities, among which Jack stood out the most to me concerning specific story elements and gameplay mechanics. So I think there's the potential for a very strong character that can actually contribute to the army's efforts. Shocking, I know. Jan's screen time is fundamentally relegated to his debut in Chapter 1, where he fights against both his brothers and the cult in order to save his father from their influence. During this section of the game, I observed Jamp to be a very noble lad that has his back against the wall and merely wants to do what is right, which I found to be very admirable and felt could have been explored even further throughout Generation 1. First and foremost, Jank makes it clear that he's against war but is willing to fight to save his father. However, upon joining Sigurd and things start to go from bad to worse, I believe it would be interesting to see him confront the prince about how this isn't what he wanted and the longer Sigurd fights, the worse things get, with the prince of Granval sympathising with Jank and offering him a chance to leave, but reassuring him that he will continue to fight to prevent more travesties like what happened with Jank's father, resulting in him realising that he needs to put his morals aside for the greater good. Sigurd, however, isn't the only aristocrat Jack may call out, as Lewin is a participant I can most 
definitely see Giant butting heads with after learning of the prince's responsibilities and how he just abandons his duty, with Lewin being dismissive at first and not interested in what he has to say. Jank, I reckon, would be persistent in explaining how lucky he is to have a mother that loves him so dearly and the luxury of no far family members who sell out their own flesh and blood. For the events of Chapter 4 making Jamp's words finally hit home and have Lewin take up the mantle and personally apologise to the prince. I swear to god, if Genealogy gets supports in the remake, we'll have the makings of probably my favourite Fire Emblem cast. No hard feelings, Awakening. <laughs> Jank in terms of battle proficiency is... Very odd. At a glance, it'd be rather easy to summarise that Jank is pretty good considering his base stats, skills and starting weapon. But then you have to realise that he's an archer and a foot unit in Fire Emblem 4. Why bother? Yeah, Reggie's right, as Jank is objectively the worst Generation 1 unit, and I for one will not have it. So to start things up, what I think Jank desperately needs to keep himself around is a personal weapon. Often, Jank's killer bow is traded to Medea, making him otherwise worthless without it. Therefore, by giving him a personal weapon with a similar build that cannot be sold or traded, will allow him to stick around more due to his offensive output. This alone isn't enough to save Jank, since in order for him to be effective, the entirety of Fire Emblem 4 would need an overhaul like reducing the map sizes, allowing Jank the option of a Bow Paladin promotion, or the ability to function similarly to the Echo's archers, but he would ultimately remain as a very useful boss killer or trump card alongside better class utility. Additionally, having an increase to his skill and defense growth won't hurt, and if it results in Jank being capable of fighting the good fight while fleshing him out at the same time, the prosperity of a genealogy remake is looking all the more tangible. <laughs> Cliff. Despite some setbacks, I felt Fire Emblem Echoes improved upon the original Gaiden in many ways, and to me, characterization was a significant highlight, as the heroes of Valentia have since become one of my all-time favourite Fire Emblem armies, though I can't say I like all of them. Oh, don't worry, we'll get to you. In the midst of all these misfits, Cliff was someone that I perceived to be left in the dust, figuratively speaking, and despite being a rather loved unit primarily for his use as a mage, Cliff to me was a severely underused underling that showed signs of something great, but ultimately failed to follow through on those ideas. Did he originally belong in Fates? I'm sure something that those of you who play Echoes noticed that not only is Cliff the quietest of the villagers, but he only has one support conversation in the entire game. Granted, Echoes doesn't have many supports to begin with, but that's still a rather pitiful number. As such, we don't know much about Cliff outside of his cold nature, most of which stems from his childhood as he was bullied often and had a very self-centered mother, making it difficult to him to resonate with others. This explains his attitude, and I think it would be great to explore this in his supports with the rest of the villagers, expressing his disdain for Grey's playboy mannerisms, envious of Arm's bravery, and sick to death of Faye's arm session. I feel you there, buddy. Though this might be fairly obvious, I feel the ideal direction for Cliff's narrative to go in is to come out of his shell and open his heart to others, demonstrating the growth of his character and how there's people out there for everyone, with the ideal instigator of this change being none other than Silk, specifically because the manga explains that they are actually half-siblings. Ensuring these two support and develop their relationship would act as an excellent way to outline their backstories, as well as how Silk is able to be the warm, tender person Cliff needs in his life. Plus, it helps that she is well-versed in magic due to it being one of Cliff's biggest interests. Thus, both Lufia and Delphia would act as ideal additional support partners. I foresee this to be a prodigious opportunity for Cliff to feel more comfortable discussing magic between them and acting in a substantially more natural manner until he no longer feels the need to push people aside. After all, there's only so much angst one can put up with before it gets annoying. Cliff starting out is actually a pretty decent unit, and is built in a way where he can function proficiently as whichever class the player chooses. The word on the street is that Archer and Cavalier are the most optimal choices, despite the popularity of the Mage class. That being said, his versatility stems from his long-term use, as starting out, his bases are on the lower end of the spectrum, initially handicapping him only to be masked by his high growth rates. Now this in of itself isn't a bad thing, but ideally I believe the numbers should be more balanced by increasing his overall stat distribution, along with making Cliff's growth less dynamic. By doing so, Cliff won't suffer from an early game crutch and be able to perform comfortably regardless of class, along with remaining a consistently solid unit throughout the endeavour, and as a result is likely to support with more characters, and if that's not a win-win, I don't know what is. Setsuna I've gone on record many times stating how I feel the Norian cast were overall superior to the Hoshido army. That's not to say I don't admire the warriors of Hoshido, as some individuals like Oboro and Kagero I was very fond of, Setsuna in particular being one of my more peculiar choices. And I say peculiar as she's generally not the most interesting individual as well as a comedy bench unit due to Takumi's superior performance, though if taken in the right direction, Setsuna could conjugate her own niche as a unit and be one of the more irregular members of the group that isn't just a one-trick pony. This game has plenty of those already. Setsuna is a retainer whose best aspects are unfortunately squandered for the sake of poking fun at her absent-mindedness, which, believe it or not, stems from her childhood. 
Being born to a noble family, Setsuna was a sheltered and silver spoon child, getting whatever she wanted and eventually becoming numb to everything around her, to the point where she purposely gets herself caught in traps just to obtain some sense of thrills. Now I for one find this to be a very interesting concept, where one is gifted with whatever they want and no longer appreciates what they have, and thus takes such extreme measures to find fulfilment. And this enables Setsuna's character to be taken in a multitude of directions, first and foremost how her attitude affects others. One of the biggest running gags in Setsuna's support is how she relies on Hinoka to do everything for her and get her out of traps regularly. Well, one of this begins to take its toll on Hinoka, as seeing Setsuna in such dangerous situations may result in her feeling that she's just as powerless back when Corrin was taken and has a breakdown, which proceeds to snap Setsuna to her senses and realise that her idea of fun only serves to hurt others, with Setsuna finally taking her role as a retainer seriously and using her energy to help rather than hinder Hinoka. Additionally, her constant need for such radical forms of entertainment might be what motivates her to fight in this war in the first place, and could in actuality be against the idea of peace that would only serve to bring her more boredom, something that could be further expanded upon in Revelations when she's able to talk to the Norians. I can easily envision Setsuna wanting to know what life in Nora is like and being enamoured with how they fight for their lives each and every day, and while both Niles and Perry would doubtlessly serve to excite her even further, the likes of the Nobles, Effie and so on could express how difficult life has been for them and they're only fighting because of their situation and not for shits and giggles, consequentially causing Setsuna to come to a realisation about herself and have faced show cast an enthralling contrast between the ideologies of individuals from both nations, all of which would accumulate in Setsuna's growth from spoiled and soulless to selfless and spiritual. Gotta love that alliteration. Unfortunately, unless Setsuna sees some action out in the field, none of those supports will ever come to light, which in her standard form is highly likely to happen, primarily due to Takumi and Reina fastly outperforming her. This I feel to be Setsuna's biggest setback, and thus I'd argue that a class change in an order, with my personal preference being the Apocryphery, as she will remain a bow user but have access to skills that make up for a low bulk, and will be given promotion options rarely featured in Birthright for that additional utility. From there, her bases are viewed to be fine, though she could use some extra resin HP, along with adjusting her growth rates with an average 10-15% increase across the board to create a superior long-term unit. I have always admired sets and strengths and wish to see them be put to better use, and hopefully this new interpretation will instigate a different type of oddball, and a unit with a far more selective niche that may not be everyone's cup of tea, but allow her to gain an identity outside of a punchline. Fiona here we have yet another Dawn Brigade unit that got royally screwed. I mean, aside from being an enemy turned friend with strong ties to Dayan that ended up contributing very little to the narrative, Fiona is without question one of the worst units in Radiant Dawn and the series history, which when considering the competition, is just plain wrong. I myself have expressed my dislike for Fiona, but that doesn't mean she's a lost cause. In fact, I perceive the makings of a very strong unit that's far more useful to the team, as well as quite the remarkable characters ties to both Tellius games. I mean, considering the position she's in at the moment, there is not much lower she can sink. Fiona, like Aaron, began Radiant Dawn as a Dayan soldier allied with Benion, and after witnessing how much of a dickhead Jared could be, she quickly turns traitor and joins the Dawn Brigade, all the more fitting since her father was one of the four riders of Dayan. With this knowledge and her position within Benion's ranks, it's easy to assume that she played a big part in Dayan's uprising and their future endeavours. Well, unfortunately, the game was already trying to do way too much, and didn't feel the need to give Fiona any progression outside of one or two base conversations, because who needs supports, am I right? Fiona could have easily played a much greater role in the story by having her act as one of Makai's main advisors due to her battle experience and association with Benion, and once part 3 comes around, the two may end up butting heads due to Makai's questionable decision making and Fiona's abhorrence for working alongside Benion once again. Heck, I wouldn't put it past Makai to initially offer the position of leader to Fiona given the circumstances, adding a sense of weight and importance to her instead of merely being there. Allowing Fiona to converse with other team members through supports I feel would do wonders and make her feel far more three-dimensional, in particular if she were to exchange dialogue between the occupants of Dayan that fought alongside Ike during the Mad King's War. It would be splendid to have the likes of Jill and Zero recall their involvement in having to fight against their homeland and how working with Ike changed them for the better, not to mention witnessing how all of this impacted Fiona in addition to learning more about the details of the aftermath of the war. Of course, she also shares a similar predicament with Aaron, Therefore, they could segment interesting exchanges that describe their time spent with Benion. Though, given what we know about the largest nation in Tellius, I reckon the supports will boil down to... What was it like working with Benion? This sucks! You know what else sucks? Fiona's performance in Radiant Dawn. In fact, Fiona is so bad that in order to be objectively good, she's going to need a huge boost. So first and foremost, I think she's in dire need of a promotion into a level 1 paladin. Naturally, with this class change, she'll require the bases to compensate, which I would increase to as follows, with a greater focus on speed, defense, and resistance, so that she can act as a solid wall against all forms of enemies, more so due to her low availability that will require her to have the base numbers to stay around through part 3. 
Concerning her growths, I personally wouldn't alter them aside from magic in order to make better use of her immune skill. As though they'd be overall very high for a pre promote, try to remember that she'll only be a level 1 paladin, so her bases won't be exceptional. However, she'll still be more than capable of holding the run from the get-go, and if the player wishes to invest, her growth will permit Fiona to become a very potent paladin that constitutes high versatility and self-sustainment with the ability to reach endgame, which is a lot better than dying on day 1. It's sad to say that Fiona is in a situation where literally anything is better than what's available, but thankfully I feel Fiona has so much going for her that doing a complete 180 is not such a far-fetched concept. Now as for Meg, she's a lost cause. Ah, oh, no fair! <laughs> Sophia. This little lady is quite the conundrum on this list since the majority of her biddens have been character focused regarding improvements, but in the case of Sophia, I think she's a pretty good character and one of the more fleshed out beings in Binding Blade. As the saying goes however, there's always room for improvement, as I feel that aspects of her life could be traversed a bit more, and sweet merciful Miller does she need a rework to her performance big time. It really says something when you make Roy look like sick in comparison. <laughs> As stated previously, I feel for the most part Sophia's characterization is otherwise fine. However, I do feel that she would greatly benefit by exploring her already established traits and emotions even further, first and foremost being her sudden involvement in the outside world. Sophia is clearly fascinated in what lies beyond Arcadia, and considering her state of affairs throughout the narrative, I would find it brilliant to expand upon both the positives and negatives of her new predicament, expressing her love for all the new locations and friends she's made, but mortified by the amount of bloodshed taking place and the vastness of human error, allowing for many conflicting emotions to reside within her and make her question the morality of the events taking place. After all, war is horrible, but without it she would have never left Arcadia and seen so many beautiful things, a little food for thought. Due to Sophia's new dilemma, she could go through numerous drastic changes in order to adjust to such an overwhelming lifestyle reversal. For example, forcing herself to try and interact with other army members even though due to her dragon blood and slower aging, she prefers to remain distant, or over-exhausting herself for the sake of using her future sight ability for the army's benefit. However, when supporting with the likes of Roy and Rey, they could reassure her that she shouldn't do anything she isn't comfortable with despite it being in their best interest, making for many conflicting ideologies that raise the question of how much you're willing to change yourself when placed in such extreme circumstances. On the subject of extreme circumstances, that's essentially Sophia in a nutshell, as she's one of the worst units in the series, with horrible bases that joins during one of the hardest chapters in the game, is outclassed by a competition and having growth rates that aren't even on the higher end of the spectrum. Heck, Gwendolyn has a better base and growth total than her. I believe we know who is the lesser of the two. For what it's worth, Sophia's problems are primarily due to her low numbers, as I feel her class is fine. But at the very least, she should start at level 10 with higher bases too. Keep in mind, she'll still be slightly weak, but by no means horrible, and can be promoted instantly just in case the user wants to give her the extra <laughs> The reason I suggest not making Sophia particularly potent is to put further emphasis on her growths, which I'd argue should be increased to substantially high levels, primarily due to Binding Bay having an overall low growth scheme, so assigning an individual very high percentages will allow them to achieve a particular niche exclusive to this game, and no Corel doesn't count, as he can only level up ONCE. In the case of Sophia, it will enable her to become extremely powerful with a significant amount of investment compared to Rey and Nimi, who are far more solid. One last item I would add to Sophia's arsenal is a personal weapon. After all, aside from the numbers, nothing about Sophia varies between the other Dark Mages. Therefore, giving her a moderately powerful tome that's perhaps super effective against certain classes much like Thani could make her reasonably potent against specific units and help her to get out of her starting rot faster, because for someone who's already one of the more interesting characters in the game, it's not exactly easy to explore that when she's dead on arrival. Astrid, but only in Radiant Dawn. Yes, it turns out the Dawn Brigade were the only ones that Radiant Dawn decided to fuck right in the ass, because my god Astrid, what did they do to you? They took one of the most sympathetic and charming lifeforms in Tellius and turned her into… this. Not to mention going from a unit that started weak but was easily capable of becoming a powerhouse with a bit of investment to… this. Needless to say, there was so much more that could have been done with Astrid in Radiant Dawn and I for one won't stand to see this fair maiden be reduced to Makalov's servant. I swear this fucker shouldn't be allowed to exist. Actually on that note, Thanos? Yeah? I need your help. I'm on it. <laughs> wow, feels so good. Due to the unfortunate event of the Crimea Royal Knights having some of the lowest availability in the game, their screen time is incredibly limited, lack of support's not helping in the slightest. Even with this handicap, I still believe there's a lot that can be done with Astrid given her position within the army, especially when regarding her origins, thus I feel Astrid would act as a fantastic role model for the younger members of Alinsia's ensemble. 
Part 2 outlines how most of the rebel forces are made up of younglings that aren't aware of the horrors of war and just want to fight for the sake of fighting. Typical teenagers. Well why not have Astrid be the one to assure them what the correct path in life is and what war is really like, along with being the voice of reason in such tense times, elevating her to the role of mental figure that I feel adds a severe amount of progression to her arc that began in Path of Radiance. That's all good concerning story elements, however there's much more to tackle regarding character interactions both old and new. In this case, I feel Master would make for a respectable support partner, as they could both bond over how they feel regarding their transition from Benion occupants to Crimea Royal Knights, in addition to having to battle their homeland later on. In fact, this could lead into her family ties, where after hearing about her role in the Mad King's War, Astra's sisters sent her letters about how proud they were of who she became. I feel it would be great for Astra to converse with her former friends too, first and foremost Gaitree, who I would envision Astrid expressing eternal gratitude towards as it was thanks to his help and training that she got to where she is now, making her very affectionate towards him along with Gaitree having much more emotional attachment to Astrid rather than physical. Secondly, there's Soph, where both parties would acknowledge the rate in which each individual has grown over these past three years and how they both achieved what they set out to do, paving the way for a very heartfelt and touching reunion. Finally, let's address the elephant in the room, Makalov, who's quietly collecting dust in the corner. Some of you may call that cruelty, I think of it as... Mercy. I firmly believe these two can have interactions that don't result in utter disdain, especially if it proceeds as follows, with Makalov being the drunken ass that he is, and everyone and their mother are on his case about him. At which point Astrid intervenes and gently lays into Makalov about his behaviour, expressing how she admires that he's so upbeat and relaxed given the circumstances, but that he needs to set an example for the rest of the army, and that Alincia has trusted him in such an important role. A conversation like this I feel is very in line with Astrid's character, and by confronting Makalov in such a manner, it could have a better chance of getting through to him since I believe positive reinforcement and constructive criticism is more effective than being a dick. And now I'm just venting. Astrid's role as a crime of Royal Knight I find to be highly questionable, due to her awful bases and bad growths too. I mean for what it's worth she still has access to Paragon, but considering her appalling availability, that won't mean shit! Therefore, I feel the level boost is in order, specifically all the way to level 10, 8 at minimum, with her stats being scaled up accordingly, particularly her speed, res and skill. I feel her growth should also be increased so that Paragon is better utilised on her and gives her long term potential despite the bad availability. And if possible, allow her access to C ranks in whichever weapon the player chose in Path of Radiance with data transfers, or barring that in A rank in both as she starts out with silver. It's not uncommon to see Radiant Dawn Astrid get so much hate because many players including myself loved her so much in Path of Radiance, and if Radiant Dawn decided to take Astrid seriously, all that love would have only grown stronger and made her possibly one of the best characters in the Telia series, and that's something our little Astrid can be very proud of. <laughs> Faye I did say we'd get to you eventually, I'm sure those of you who have been watching me for a decent amount of time are aware about my feelings towards Faye and her ALM session. And for those who don't know, here's a quick reminder. You are the worst character to come out of the previous era that isn't an NPC! Yeah, I'm not a fan. The strangest part about all of this is, I actually feel Faye has tons of talent, and could become from my perspective, a really great character without drastically changing who she is, including her fixation with ARM. Impossible you say? Well they said it was impossible for Gwendolyn to be useful, and that bitch killed to feel. To me, impossible means nothing! Faye's relationship with ARM is a core part of her character, Actually, it's the only part of her character. So personally, I don't believe this aspect should be removed, otherwise she'd be a completely different person. Though I do feel it should be drastically toned down to prevent her from becoming any more annoying. Um, 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 um. Shut the fuck up! With that said, I feel the best way for our arm session to be utilised is for it to be used as a catalyst for conversations with others instead of a cutoff point. Due to Arm's role in Echoes as the leader of the Deliverance, many characters like Clive and Claire are fascinated with the young farm boy, and it's safe to assume they'd like to know more about him, which is where Faye comes in. By communicating with the likes of Claire for example, Faye could recall her experiences with Arm that would further flesh out both their backstories and the personal connection she has with him while simultaneously enlightening Claire as to what makes Arm an ideal leader. Plus by witnessing how headstrong Claire is, might just inspire Faye to become more independent. Additionally, if she were to support with Selica, they could reminisce about the good times and bring her up to speed on what she missed, along with both of them coming to terms with their feelings towards the young lord, enabling Faye to be far more friendly and open with other characters that transforms her quirk into a help rather than a hindrance. Of course Faye's arm session had to have stemmed from somewhere, and I wager this began once Selica left the village, as Faye would be the only other girl in the group after Selica left, 
and I imagine the boys would be typical boys and try not to include Faye in their activities. Little bastards. Arm, however, I pictured to be far more considerate towards Faye and try to get her involved as much as possible, which I feel would make her fascination far more understandable, not to mention rather emotional considering her entire story arc could be structured in a way that embodies the idea of maturity. The reason I say this is because Arm makes it clear that he has no intention of returning to Ram Village and wants more out of life. However, this could be difficult for Faye as because of the war, they become rather distant, eventually reaching the point where she declares to Arm that she doesn't want to continue fighting if it means they can't be together. Though by the end she comes to terms with the fact that Arm is forging his own path in life and she must do the same and move on. You can't live in your basement forever, honey. As bad as Faye got in the character department, I would never sully her name regarding performance. As it's common knowledge among Echo players that Faye is an amazing healer and works well as other classes too. I mean, she was no Claire, but my Faye was an awesome Pegasus Knight. Regardless, I still think she could use a bit of a buff, in particular increasing her skill in speed stat and slightly adjusting her growth rate so that she struggles less initially and has a superfluous level of viability when assigned to whichever class. I may have been extremely harsh on Faye, and as things go, she's probably going to remain as one of my least favourite Fire Emblem characters, but that doesn't mean I won't acknowledge what's good about her, and I feel that if she tones down her obsession and uses it to communicate rather than conceal, she's got the makings of true waifu material. Perry. Poor Perry, what on earth went wrong with you? I find it relatively commonplace for certain farming characters to be very 50-50 regarding people's opinions, just look at Corrin and Tharja. Perry, however, seems to be the absolute worst case offender of this, as you either love Perry, or you feel she's an abomination that should be beaten, starved, burnt alive and thrown into the fires of hell to suffer for eternity. And that's the nice version of it. I for one do like Perry, but I'm also not blind to her fault, and holy shit does she have fault. Like seriously, some of these supports are just ugh. However, there's a strong reason as to why she's such an anomaly, because I really do think there are elements of her character that are excellent. In fact, they're so good that if given the proper treatment, she could theoretically become one of the most complex and well-written characters in Fates. Granted, they may not seem like much due to the quality of Fates writing, but if they can get Nyx and Takumi right, there's hope for Perry. Before I get into Perry's character changes, I'm going to quickly address her objective performance, which is overall decent, and Perry is by no means a bad unit. However, she suffers from being underleveled and frail in addition to serious competition. Naturally, Perry could use some extra training by buffing her up to level 15 with scaled bases, in particular HP and defense due to her gross, which I feel are fine, and considering most of the following units that join will be pre-promotes, she will need those additional numbers, along with a C rank in both weapons. That I feel should be enough, but Perry also retains one of the best personal skills in the game, Aside from the fact that granting her 4 points in magic in most situations is useless, therefore ideally I think upon eviscerating her enemies, she should gain additional points of defense. Or luck. Or fucking anything, just not magic. Now let us discern Parry herself, which for those who don't know, is kinda cool crazy in the sense that she'll happily kill others and has a childlike maturity, that at times betrays her to feel like senseless murder is A-OK. -okay. Now her backstory does shed light on the fact that she wasn't always like this, and that it was primarily caused by the death of her mother who was murdered by one of the servants. However, the problem lies in how her supports exemplify certain traits, as the likes of her supports with Odin detail how she's in charge of an anchor management classes and attempts to control her violent tendencies. That's good. And in her supports with Benny, she threatens to kill people unless she gets some sweets. That's bad. This happens very frequently with Perry, and naturally, she comes off as an incredibly inconsistent and strange individual. However, I feel there's a way to take what's been established and rework it to make Perry far more intricate, by way of turning her violent outbursts into a mental disorder. Now, I'm well aware that I'm touching upon a very sensitive subject matter, and I'm certainly not the most knowledgeable person to be discussing it, so if you feel like I make any mistakes or get too presumptuous, feel free to correct me, just please don't be an ass about it. With that said, by having the murder of Perry's mother and the act of killing other servants instead being forced upon her by her father against her will, to the point where it felt natural to behave in such a way growing up even though deep down she knew it was wrong but couldn't do anything about it in fear of her own life, thus falling victim to developing a split personality that takes over under extreme stress or bloodlust. By using this synopsis, I feel it would make her situation far more understandable given the horrors she's experienced. And now that the new foundations have been established, I feel her support and overall characterization can explore various avenues due to the nature of her condition. Though her supports will vary from person to person, I find it easy to picture the likes of Corrin and Laszlo trying to help and understand Perry, shedding light on her backstory and demonstrating that issues like these shouldn't be tackled alone, along with how a lot of this trauma and childlike behavior stems from her inability to move on from her mother's passing and let go. 
Adding to this, her relationship with Xander could be an exceptionally interesting avenue to explore. After all, she could question why he made her his retainer considering she only came third in the tournament and there are far more skilled soldiers for the job. Plus, there's the case of a general attitude and severe handicap, which many people resent and scold her for, making her feel inadequate and loathsome, at which point Xander expresses that he feels she has a greater resolve than anyone in Nor, and the fact that she's trying so hard despite her disposition shows that her potential is immense and that she shouldn't be treated any differently from others, as he simply wants Perry to become the best that she can. To quote the star spangled man with a plan, a strong man who has known power all his life will lose respect for that power, but a weak man knows the value of strength and knows compassion making the relationship between them much more intimate. When looking at this from a different perspective, some of her supports could serve as a way to demonstrate how a killing persona comes about based on circumstances and how difficult it is for her to control it. Such as say, when Felicia spills tea on her and Perry lashes out merely as a reflex and feels awful about it after coming too. But also how in times of crisis, it has turned the tide in her favour and saved her life as well as perhaps other comrades too. In fact, I feel Reyna would commend and encourage her to embrace who she is rather than fight it. And I'm not trying to imply that conditions like this are something to celebrate, but I'm a firm believer in looking at the positives and negatives in all aspects of life. It's also key to note that Perry, by nature, is a very sweet and childlike woman with incredible cooking skills, which baffles individuals that know her to be a psychopath as demonstrated in her supports with Kaze. Therefore, having characters see her for who she really is instead of what her reputation has garnered demonstrates that people shouldn't judge others before they get to know them. I mean, Perry and Charlotte would have interesting parallels about being true to themselves and the concept of others' personas being literal and figurative. Plus, Perry and Benny have the makings for very endearing interactions, as they're both feared on the outset, but deep down are absolute sweethearts. At any rate, it's gotta be better than... Give me sweets. Or I'll kill you. It upsets me so much just to see how poorly Perry was handled in Fates, and I only wish to see her become the best that she can. By addressing the previously outlined issues and more, I feel it could potentially mold Perry into a very complex and sympathetic character that still retains many of her likeable qualities and grows significantly through her supports. This could also be the first time to my knowledge that Fire Emblem tackles the subject matter of mental disability, that while extremely layered and difficult to fully explore, would help to elevate a series that's already known for addressing various real world issues even further, which is a far better alternative than being one of the most hated characters in the series history, which is saying a lot. And it's because of this I feel Perry should take the number one spot as the Fire Emblem unit above all others that deserves a second chance. This has been Blazing Night. I wish you all a great night, take care, and though Fire Emblem doesn't exactly hit a home run with its characters on every occasion, they often find there to be something of value to all of them, and the good far outweighs the bad. And I can all but hope that Free Houses continues the tradition. Thank you all very much for watching today, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Please let me know what you thought in the comments, and what are some of the Fire Emblem characters that you feel deserve a second chance, whether it be regarding character changes or their objective performance. Also, please remember to hit that like button, subscribe and hit that notification bell. You can also follow me on Twitter, Amino, Discord, and if you'd like to go the extra mile, I would very much appreciate it if you would support me on Patreon, where you can get some exclusive benefits. And before I bid you all farewell, I'd like to say a huge, huge thank you to all my wonderful patrons who help support this channel and make these videos possible. Thank you, you people are the absolute best and I love you. And I'd like to give shoutouts to my very special patrons Nate Perkins, Chaos Sableye, Karen Chowdhury, Justin Konovich, Vanessa Westfall, Vinton Clark, Midnight Castle, Potanko Fan32, Maggie Fall, Almond, Jeremy Redinger, The Main Idea, Perfect Oblivion, and Ferrolin8392. You people are the absolute best. I love you. Anyway, that's it from me. I'll see you all next time.